outro cast. Okay, well, Phil, I'm going to say for you, it's good afternoon. For me, it's good morning. But how's your day going besides doing all these interviews and talking about yourself too much? Well, um, I haven't done any interviews today. <clears throat> and um, I'm uh, very well here. I'm here in London, <clears throat> near uh, West London, near Notting Hill. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts are you? Long Island, New York, where you've played a few times. It wasn't the usual tour stop for you. You know, no. you're more uh, of a Madison Square Garden kind of guy. Jones Beach. Hey, Jones Beach. <clears throat> five miles from here. And there's so many things that I want to ask you. But let me start with the housekeeping first. You've got a new book. How long did it take to actually write the book? And has it been done for about a year at this point? Um, it has been done for about a year, but it took about seven years <laughs> wow. because obviously I'm a musician, not a writer. And, you know, when I'm sitting down trying to write something, I'm thinking, well, oh, this is well, now, I'm not writing it like that. I wish I could. <clears throat> I'm right. trying to type it. My fingers are used to playing a guitar, not typing. <laughs> so it, it goes on and on. And I'm thinking. I'd rather be spending my time actually doing some music. So that's why it took so, <laughs> it took so long. And it and also, you know, I had to get help in the end because, uh, you know, it doesn't come easy. And even though I could remember anything, I have all the pictures and all that. It's quite different. And I've told these stories lots of times in interviews and that's why people asked me to do a book they said yo you should do a book i said oh great okay and then i try writing i think oh this is taking forever you know <clears throat> and um, you know what i came to realize <clears throat> is that the difference between writers and novelists and uh playwrights and everything <clears throat> they take ages to write stuff and uh Quite right, because it's very difficult and it's complicated. If you've got a novel, if you've got uh, non-fiction, you've got to analyze, you've got to do all the research, etc. Mm -hmm. Musicians, we can write a song in five, ten minutes. It's still being played fifty years later. It's so unfair. Writers, they write a book. People might read it once. Well, definitely once, maybe twice at the most, yeah. and boom, they've got to write another one. How lucky are we? You know, so. You know, in doing this and trying to make sense of what's happened in the last 52 years in music for me and also my family, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I've learned a lot and it took a bit of time, you know. Well, if I can give you a compliment here, because uh, I promise this is going to tie in with a compliment, I would imagine that writing the book for you is harder because when somebody looks at your output, you always have a solo record, a collaboration record, a Roxy thing you're co-producing. You've been so steadily uh, going with your output that you like to look ahead. You like to push the ball forward, whereas writing the book is looking backwards. It's a different thing for you, Phil. Absolutely, 100%. You know, that's why, you know, to a certain extent, it's a bit like, OK, let's get all this down, wipe the slate clean. Let's look forward and get on with new stuff, which yeah. is exactly on the day this book was published, which was like two weeks ago. We I started doing three gigs, live gigs in Soho, London, with Andy Mackay and Paul Thompson, kind of playing an experimental kind of avant-garde electric rock music. Um mm -hmm. I had no idea really what was going to happen or, or do anything, but we were immediately moving forward at the same time selling the books out the front of the past. <laughs> yeah, that's a, an interesting facet of your career where you can do really commercially oriented things, but then very, uh, what's the word, experimental or very non-commercial kind of things at the same time. So we never know what we're going to get from you. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I said that eve it was three evenings. I was saying to the audience after we finished the track, I said, wow, what was that? I've never heard any music like that before. What was that? I've got no idea. Um, right, let this going to be different, hopefully in a good way. But <laughs> anything can happen. 
and well, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. But what we learn in studying your career is that sometimes you can do something that's not commercially oriented and then it gets sampled and it turns out to be the most commercially successful thing you've ever done. So, you know, yeah, I, I don't know what the the lesson or the outlying thing is for your career. It's just you push the ball forward and you do things you're proud of. <clears throat> ah, OK, and there's a word you mentioned there, which doesn't really figure in my. Um in my thoughts which is career <laughs> because i never thought of a career mm -hmm. in music i just thought of playing music being free uh make having musical conversations with fellow musicians and just seeing where it led there was no master plan as there was no master plan in roxy we wanted to be we were inspired amateurs we wanted to be professional we wanted to get better and better and we just headed off, you know, and there's um, a great phrase in Spanish, viaje sin rumbo, mm -hmm. a journey without uh, direction sort of thing. We just like follow your nose type thing. And um, I just uh, hand delivered a copy of the book to Eno actually about uh, an hour ago. And, uh, you know, there's a guy who just has just like followed his nose. Uh, you could never predict what he's going to do next. It's extraordinary. You may have just answered the question, but one of the things that I was curious about, I didn't think that the book directly answered this, was a lot of people of your stature, and I'm I'm calling you, you know, the tops, because when you play Madison Square Garden, you work for 40 to 50 years steadily. I call you the tops. Yeah. A lot of people of your level, they have that kind of commercially bottoming out period in the early to mid 80s where they notice the venues are smaller, the advances are lower, and they go, what am I going to do? It doesn't seem like you ever had that in your career. Well, <clears throat> it may have happened if people could look at it and say, oh, look, that's what happened then. But the thought never occurred to me. You know, it was always like looking forward, what's the next adventure? And then, you know... <clears throat> to a certain extent musicians and uh actors and all these kind of people who are sort of freelance really think i'll never work again mm -hmm. i finish and then a phone goes and with one phone call your life changes <laughs> you know and you just got to take a deep breath you know stay in your lane do what you do and um things will happen you know if you've done the preparation and like between the age of 10 and 20, I guess I did the preparation. I was ready to take advantage of opportunities. And and then you get your skills together or your non-skills, whatever your, your, your concept is. <clears throat> and then whatever happens, happens. It's sort of random and you, you can get lucky. It's a bit like gambling to a certain extent, but you've got to be ready, you know, to to take advantage of it, you know. Another big takeaway from your book, I don't think that most people who are fans of your music knew about your multicultural background, that you grew up in all these different places. Was that something that you kept a secret or just something that you never really had the form to go into depth about? Well, nobody ever asked me <laughs> about it. You know, people, uh, um, journalists and stuff were just obsessed by their idea of how music and rock and roll music evolved mm -hmm. whether from the via the blues delta or via you know psychedelia uh, drugs and stuff uh, or uh, the british sort of um, cloning of american blues into a white blues situation then bringing it back to america the stones and cream and clapton and <clears throat> Um, but people weren't interested in music from other countries then. You know, they were interested in European based systems music, electronic music, the history of all that. <clears throat> but nobody bothered to ask me any questions about, hey, you got a funny name. Um, where's that from? You know? <laughs> yeah, the magic word is Sephardic. And yes. I, yeah, I didn't I didn't have you on the list. You know, when you're grown up Jewish, at first yeah. you're you're trained to think, okay, so Jews are primarily lawyers and accountants and those kinds of 
professions. And then as you get a little older, you go, oh, there's Jewish rappers, there's Jewish heavy metal artists, etc. I didn't have you on my list of people of Jewish descent until I read this book. Zimmerman. Well, Robert Zimmerman, Bob Dylan. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, no, neither did I. I mean, all this in the book, I discover all this. You know, and I, I you know, and, and it continues. I mean, three weeks ago, I was in Curaçao, mm -hmm. which is a little island in the Dutch Antilles off Venezuela, looking for the graves in Jewish cemeteries of my great grandmother, my great, great, great grandmother, great, 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 great. And I found him. And I, I found and my, you know, I only found out that my grandmother was born in Curaçao and was of Jewish Sephardic Jewish descent mm -hmm. when I was about 60. <clears throat> and, you know, I've got 50 cousins in Colombia. They all I made a little film for them of my trip to Curaçao. <laughs> and they're delighted, you know, and I tell you one of the reasons they're extra specially delighted is because if you have Sephardic Jewish background, you can get a Portuguese passport. Oh. It means you can come to Europe. You don't have to give up your American one. You don't have to give up your British one. For Brits, well, I call myself a Brit, but, you know, well, that's a big, long story. Um, Brexit was a disaster. You know, we couldn't, we're out of Europe. But I, you know, any, suddenly this thing appeared in the Times newspaper. If you have Sephardic Jewish descent, you can apply to Spain or Portugal and get a passport. And that lets you into Europe. <laughs> so... You know, that so, you know, it doesn't really matter, Brexit. But so that spurred me on. And then I continue discovering. And now I have the certificates from the elders at the synagogue in Curaçao signed by the public notary, which means that I could apply for the Portuguese passport. Wow. So you have so many titles and all that at this point in your <laughs> career. And I wasn't aware of you being an author before this book came out. So when we go author, musician, songwriter, producer, sideman, et cetera, is there a job profession or title that you're still hoping will happen one day? Is there a film producer kind of thing that you're aspiring to? No, no, I, I really don't want to do any more work at all, really, you know. I'd rather just lounge around and uh, play with the grandchildren and just have a good time. But I do like music and it's very therapeutic for me and I know for other people. So and it's good for your health. So I will continue. If I see a guitar and I'm in my studio now in London and behind me over there, there's about six acoustic guitars. I'm dying to pick one up, actually, because I haven't touched them for about three months and have a go on them. And it's like keeping myself interested in music. And if I see a guitar anywhere, I have to go and pick it up. And so I, I strategically place guitars all over the place. So here and in my little English cottage. And I said, oh, right, just let me pick that up. And I think, oh, I'm, I remember. That's why I'm doing this. I like music. I like the sound of the vibration of the strings, et cetera, you know. Do you go to concerts at all? I do go to concerts. I go to all kinds of concerts, classical concerts, uh, rock concerts. I go to ballet, not that partial on opera. I do go to opera, but uh, that's a friend forces me to go. Um, but we, me and my wife, we love music. You know, it, it's a background to our lives. So, <laughs> and... Um, yeah, absolutely. Just as uh, I'm a fan, I'm a music fan, like in normal guys, girls. So if I can build an, an assumption from that, you're a music fan and that's why you're able to collaborate with Tim Finn and John Wedden and Andy, et cetera, who have nothing to do with one another, that you're always looking ahead and going, yeah, that sounds fun, I'll try that. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> It, it's always interesting. I mean, <clears throat> for instance, I I did something two years ago, which came out, a record that came out two weeks ago with Rod Stewart and Jules Holland with a swing band, 18-piece band playing 30s, 40s songs. It was number one two weeks ago. And I never, uh, the, the old me talking to the young me, 
I say, would you ever do a jazz swing album? I said, never in my life will I be involved with something like that. I ended up doing it. I, uh, seven of the 13 tracks I produced. How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. It was fun. You know, I'm not going to do it again, probably ever. But again, another musical adventure in there. It's not, obviously not in the book. <laughs> well, speaking of the book, though, being that it took you seven ish years and you're somebody who, even since the book has come out, new stuff has happened. Of <laughs> note, Do you have enough leftovers and or new tales or things you didn't talk about that you think that there could be a volume two of the book? No, I definitely don't want to spend another seven years trying to do volume two. <laughs> Excuse me. I'd rather spend the time doing music, quite frankly. But um, I'm sure in the interviews that I do, I will be able to spin a, a few extra stories that I've also forgotten to put in this one. And there's lots of stuff which I left out. You know. Wow. Well, two quick questions and then I let you go. And the, the first one, do you have any stupid hobbies? Uh, for example, are you a big boxing fan or an MMA fan? Is there anything off brand that's not classy about you, Phil? <clears throat> well, I, I will find myself watching sport. Uh, I'm glued to it, e even though if it, it's like watching paint dry, I'll even watch cricket which is the British, which seems like the slowest uh, game. I mean, yes. snooker. I don't know why. I can watch snooker for hours. It's very calming and, 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 and wonderful. And, you know, um, but I like swimming. I mean, I've always liked swimming. So that's my go-to sort of, it's not a stupid thing. It's a great thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was brought up swimming, and I will swim till I pass out. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And th then this last question, I don't know if it gets a two second no or an anecdote that's never been told before. And that's, have has your path ever crossed with any member of Van Halen at any point in time that you almost did a session alongside any member of Van Halen? Absolutely no recollection of doing any anything with Van Halen at all. Obviously, when he first did, turned up with that ridiculous incredible tapping thing I was like my jaw dropped and I knew I'd never be able to do that but I was in awe of that so maybe one day someone will teach me how to do tapping but so far nothing's happened <laughs> but that that's just the one legendary group that doesn't get mentioned in your book or your travels <laughs> over the years so I figure that was cutting room floor stuff but the <laughs> Bottom line is I'm looking forward to your next music because it never stops with you. Congratulations on the book and hope to see you live in New York in the very near future. Well, that would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe with the AMPM project that we just did. Outrocast.